Hey there, thank you for joining us uh, today on this very different Memorial Day weekend. Um, it's different in our house, I imagine it is in, in yours as well, but I'm thankful that you're here to spend this time with us. Um, just give you a heads up, we're, we're going to move the service around a bit today. We'll do the message up front, and then the singing and communion will, will come after that. But we're going to get back into this, this series that we started last week. We're calling Strangers in a Strange Land. And I, as, I, as I think about that, 122 years ago, I turned 17. And when I turned 17, I joined the Navy. I'd never been on a plane before. Uh, we flew to... Um, Orlando where I went to boot camp and you, you come in and then suddenly the next day your whole world starts to change. Um, I went from having this super cool mullet to being completely bald and wearing bell bottoms and I had a, a some sort of dog bowl that they gave me for a hat and it, everything just was so very different and I wasn't a kid that went to you know ROTC so marching was something very very new for me and very difficult to to learn <laughs> but it as I looked around and I realized that uh, the whole world was different and I felt like I didn't belong and I'm thinking what in the world did you get yourself into as um, you know, I'm dressed different and talking different. As a matter of fact, not talking much at all and walking different. And everything around me said, dude, you are a stranger in a strange land. Oftentimes, I think Christians feel that way. As we get into our Bibles and we know what it looks like or we read what it looks like to follow Jesus, but that, that life is so very different than what we experience. And we say, well, if I'm supposed to be associated with Jesus, this looks very different. How in the world could I do that? Uh, it, it all seems well and good here, but I don't know that it works in real world. It's just I, I'd be a stranger in a strange land. But you can flip that picture on its head, too as those who didn't grow up in church and those who come from a very different background come into church world and suddenly folks talk different and they say things like blessed and for some reason everybody wants to hug and we've all got you know corny bumper stickers they can feel like a stranger in a very strange land as well and so as we try to tackle both of those, we're going to open 1 Peter. If, you, if you've got a Bible, would you either turn it on or, or open it to, to 1 Peter chapter 1? And Peter's going to be our guide. When I say Peter here, that's not just a name. Uh, this is the Apostle Peter, fisherman. Um, fisherman, honestly, with a big mouth that comes to know Jesus, and it changes his world. And here we're going to step into this letter that he writes to some churches that are really struggling because they're living as strangers in a strange land. Last week, as we, as we started this series, we, we saw that he was saying tomorrow's hope gives light for today's struggles. And today, as we get back into chapter one again, we're going to see that tomorrow's hope guides today's actions. So we're going to learn a, a little bit about what it means to live as Christians in a very different context. So 1 Peter chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 13. Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded, set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Hey, can we pause and pray for just a moment? God, we thank you for these words. We thank you for the words that your spirit guided Peter to write so long ago and how relevant they are to us today. Would you work in our hearts? Would you point us to your son? Would you remind us of the hope that we have? In Christ's name, amen. So Peter here writes, he says, Set your mind on this, you, you, with your minds ready for action. Be sober-minded. Think clearly. Set your hope completely on Jesus. 
And we, we talked about this last week a bit when he talks about salvation. Um, in, in this context, what he's talking about is that time when Jesus shows up and we see him face to face when he returns. Peter's saying, you've got to set your mind on this. Be sober-minded. Think, think straight. Think straight about that day when, when Jesus will make everything right. What's that day look like? That's a day when there'll be justice, complete and thorough and right justice, once and for all. That's a day where there'll be freedom from sin. Think about it. When I, when I talk about sin, what I'm talking about are those, those things that you do that you're not, you know you're not supposed to do but also the things you know you're supposed to do that you don't do. And who's kidding who? That stuff you let hang out in your heart. Freedom from, from all that. Freedom from the consequences of that. Freedom from the, the struggle with that. But also, freedom from sickness and death. Freedom from all of that old system that's brought to an end as Jesus makes everything new and makes everything right. Peter says, with that, put your, focus your mind, think clearly about that. Gird up your mind is literally what the text says. It says, gird up your mind. Now that, it, the reason why that doesn't make a lot of sense is because we don't live in their world. But in their world, um, you know, dudes wore long robes. Well, you weren't going to be a man of action with you know, running around in a dress. So when he said, they would say literally, gird up your loins, which meant you take that, pull it up, tuck it in your belt. So like you're ready for action, you're ready for battle. Peter uses that picture and he says, gird up your mind. In other words, uh, that's sort of a, a, an old way of saying roll up your sleeves. Be ready. Think clearly. Focus your hope on what's to come. That hope of when Jesus returns. Oh, a couple weeks ago, uh, a couple of buddy, buddies of mine called and said, hey man, we're going fishing on Friday. And you need to get out and you need to go fishing with us. And I'm going to tell you right now, for a guy that loves to be outside, there was a certain hope that like, I was so thankful for not to have to look at these walls for a bit uh, to, to, you know, just to picture myself out on the water and hearing the waves lap up against the side of the boat, you know, hang out with buddies, go fishing. Now, what I found was since I had that, that hope, that hope of just going fishing in a couple of days, it changed the way that I was acting. Because it, it directed what I was doing. I, I had to get stuff ready. I had to make sure I had my license up to date. I wanted to make sure that, you know, uh, all of my gear was right. I want to make sure I showed up with the right stuff. But it also helped me to avoid other things. So, you know, when, when my wife is saying, hey, we need to get started on this project, I'm going, no, no, I'm going fishing. So I can do that after so it, 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 it gave me joy, it guided my actions, and it helped me to avoid other things as well. The, the hope of fishing on Friday was guiding my actions on, on Wednesday. Now take that picture and multiply that by about 10 billion. One day, Jesus will return. One day, we'll see him face to face. Not, not in a book, not in a picture, not on a big screen. We'll stand and see him face to face. And he makes everything right. And he brings justice 
and he removes sin and he washes me of these struggles that I can't seem to to get over, those things that I continually fight with and he restores relationships and he reunites us with loved ones who have gone to already be with him. And I, I, I think about that and I go, first I go, gosh, maybe today, Lord. Maybe today. But see, that hope is so huge and so overwhelming that it provides an inner joy. Uh, the Bible talks about um, a peace that surpasses understanding. It, it provides a joy that, that is bigger than, than the struggles we're dealing with now. It provides a hope that is bigger than the, the things that we do deal with now but not only does it provide a hope but it directs our actions it's like i got to be ready i want to know him i want to i want to uh, uh be ready when he returns i'm, I'm serious are, 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 are you gonna be there with me you see it guides the way that we live today but not only that it helps us to avoid other actions as well it helps us to avoid getting hung up in certain things because I don't want to be I don't want to be hung up in this when Jesus returns. You know the the old preachers used to say I, I don't I don't want to do anything that I wouldn't be embarrassed to do if it was the last hour of my life. I want to be ready, sleeves rolled up, thinking clearly is what Peter says. That's. The, the guide for life. In other words, tomorrow's hope guides today's actions. Look, look, look at what he says in verse 14, though. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as the one who uh, called you as holy, you also are to be holy in your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I'm holy. He's quoting an Old Testament verse. Be holy as I'm holy is what God's saying. Now, let, let, let's think about this. These are folks who didn't grow up in church. These are folks who, who don't have that picture. And they, they came from a very different background. And that's why he says, when he uses ignorance, he, he, it's not an insult. He's just saying, back when you didn't know. So you don't, you don't be conformed to the lifestyle before you knew Christ. But the one who called you is holy, so we're to live holy. Peter's saying, you didn't know back then, but you do now. And because you do now, you need to live like it. The, the God who rescued us and gives us this hope, he's holy. So you and I are, are, are to work towards that holiness as well. Now, here's the thing, is when we, we think of holiness, we tend to think of a list of do's and don'ts. Hey, do this, don't do that. You know, when, when I grew up going to church camp, it was, you know, don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls who do. That's, what, that's, that's the way that we viewed holiness. And I'm here to tell you, honestly, that that's kind of a poor understanding of what it means to be holy. What, what, what's it mean to be holy? Well, to get that, we need to look carefully at God. He's the picture. He's the only one. And you say, well, what's it look like to look at God? Well, I'm just, look at Jesus. If you want to see a clear picture of God, all you have to do is look at Jesus. Look at the way he responds. Look at his priorities. Look at the, the way that he leads. Look at the way that he loves. And when you do, You'll see that he's just. You'll see that he's compassionate. You'll see that he's patient. You'll see that he's loving. You'll see that he's forgiving. You'll see that he's merciful. Uh, you, what you'll see is a multi-angled uh, 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 approach of what it looks like to live holy, to live a life that pleases God. Uh, here's a real simple way of looking at it. It's all the ways that we hope God will treat us. 
That's what it looks like to live holy. For us to be holy is to, to conform out the ways that we think and the ways that we act around God's character, around who he is. We see things like justice. And honestly, we love justice typically just for other people. And I can prove to you that we love justice because how many versions of NCIS television are there? Think about it. We love justice shows. We love shows where the bad guy gets it. Why? Because God is just and he's written that into our character. We love compassion. The problem is, is we typically don't have the guts to step out and to act on it. Compassion, I, I, I was reading Brendan Manning as a, an author that I, that I just love. He writes this sentence, compassion starts when we know why our enemy cries. Man, that'll pack a punch. When we care enough to know the troubles of those that we don't like. Here, here's another way to look at it. Paul gave a similar list. Uh, in the church world, we call it the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, and self-control. Those are the list that when, when that starts to work itself out in our lives, in a lifestyle of worship and communication with God, we see what holiness is. Remember, it's because we set our hope, we set our plans on seeing Jesus. You see, the hope of tomorrow, tomorrow's hope, gives light to today's struggles, but it gives a uh, purpose to today's actions as well. And here, here's the thing. We can't mess with the formula. I had a friend that, that was a scientist, and he would tell me, Steve, wh whenever there's a formula, it has to be followed exactly. So if it says uh, you mix A with B and you stir it 12 times and then add C and stir it another 12 times. He said, if you add A, B, and C and then just stir it as many times as you want, you've absolutely ruined it because you didn't follow the formula. Now, now why that's important here is we have to pay attention to the formula that God gives. He calls and then we change. So he calls grace, he provides us grace and love and he brings us to him and then we go through the work of conforming our lives to him. Here's where we get this formula all screwed up. I hear this over and over and over. I'm gonna get my life together and then I'm gonna come back to church. When we, when we do that, we've, we've ruined the formula because honestly, you're not ever gonna get your life together apart from Jesus. He's the hope. He's the source. He's the one who will make it right. That's why he didn't say, come to me, everybody who's got it together. He said, come to me if you're all messed up and you're tired. I'll give you rest. And then our lives are bent around his purposes and they're reformed and he gives us joy. But he's not done here. Look at verse 17. If you appeal to the Father who judges impartially according to each one's work, you're to conduct yourself in reverence during your time living as strangers. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Peter says, during your time as strangers, while you're living as strangers in a strange land, conduct yourself with reverence, depending on the translation that you read. The word is technically fear. Conduct yourself with fear. Now, the, the reason why we, we, we choose reverence often in that is because there, there's a, a wrong picture here. We don't fear God out of punishment if you know Jesus is Lord. If you fear God out of punishment, what we're saying is the cross wasn't enough. 
Jesus really didn't pay it all. You see, but because he did pay it all, I don't have to fear punishment, retribution. Now, he does discipline like any good dad, but I don't have to fear punishment. Now, but what I do, or why we do stand in this fear, this, this awe, it's holiness. It's because of who he is. And let, let, let me try to give this picture. We, we read and we like that, that God is love. And we know that God loves people. And not just he has love, he is love. In other words, he cannot not be love. He's love through and through. But he's also holy. Perfect through and through. You see, so when the object of his love, people, you and I, are not holy, there's, there's a tension. There's a tension that has to be resolved. Either he could end the love and end us, or resolve the, the love by forgetting that he's holy. Well, that doesn't seem to make sense. The other option was for him to come into the scene himself, to write himself into the story. And to come and to live a life that you and I would refuse to live. And then pay the price that you and I deserved. He took the punishment so that we didn't have to. When I step back and look at that, at a God who loves so much, the Bible says, this says, this is love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us and he sent his son to to pay the price. And I look at his holiness. And if you want to see what holiness, the, the, this, this concept of, 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 of complete purity and, and what is required of that, look at the cross. And when I see his love and holiness together, I stand back in awe and a holy sort of reverence. You see, yes, God is our dad and he's our father and we have this intimate relationship, but we need to be cautious when we consider who he is. He's incredible and there's nothing else like him. And because of that, we stand back carefully and we recognize that we don't, by our own nature, belong with him. And yet he loves us so much that he's brought us into his family. And he's made us his kids. That doesn't, when, when, when you get that picture right, it doesn't create a casual relationship with God. It creates a reverent and holy, careful relationship with who he is. And that is, that Peter get, gets into this picture here when he says the why. Man, the why here is incredible. The, the, the word that we translate here is redeemed. Is redeemed. Um, was used in their society of buying back a slave. Now, I'm, I'm going to step for just a minute into the world of the people who first read this letter. Okay, so they would have pagan temples. They would have temples that for a god or goddess. And slaves could be brought to a temple and they would a, a, a sum of money, a large sum of money would be given to the temple. And of course, a little side cut for, for the one who owned this slave. And that, that slave would be redeemed. That slave would be bought out of slavery, but they would be known going forward as belonging to, to that, that pagan god. Peter takes that picture and he says, you were redeemed. Not something, by not something like silver or gold. Not something perishable. Not something that's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. You were set free with the blood of Jesus. What an incredible picture that is. A picture of where holiness and love meet. 
Now listen to Peter with that in mind again. If you, if you appeal to the Father who judges impartially according to each one's work, you are to conduct yourself in reverence during your time living as strangers. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. You were redeemed at the cross. God hates sin, but God loves us. How did he put that together? By Jesus coming. Coming and living a life that you and I would refuse to live to die a death that we deserved. That builds a reverence. I, I, I think back of, you know, when I was, I was just a kid going to boot camp, uh, learning, learning what it meant to be a sailor in the Navy, learning what it meant to, to be a part of something bigger, learning how to find my place in there. And, you know, there, there's a similar picture to that as we learn what it means to live in the family of God, what it, what it means to be a part of something that honestly may feel like a stranger in a strange land. Peter says, hey, if that's you, roll up your sleeves. Get ready. Think clearly. Let the hope of tomorrow guide the way that you live today as we mold our character around who God is and we stand in awe of the cross. We stand in awe of what he's done for us. That is a message that we need to hear over and over and over. I don't care if you've been a Christian for 10 minutes or 30 years. Or maybe, maybe you don't know Jesus is Lord. And I, I, I've, I've explained what this looks like. And I'm here to tell you that today's a day where you can make that choice to receive his grace and let him go about the work of putting things to rights in your life. Washing away sin, guaranteeing tomorrow. Tomorrow with him. And that hope of tomorrow will change everything today. If that's you, uh, reach out in, in the, there's a prayer column there, you know, just reach out or, or call the, the church or send an email, however you do it. And I promise that today we can talk about what this looks like. Would you pray with me? Father, I thank you for a hope that is secure and a hope that is bigger than financial struggles or marital struggles or family problems, or COVID-19. I thank you for a hope that is secure in your Son, demonstrated in the resurrection. God, would you let that hope today guide the way that I live, the way that we live right now. That hope of tomorrow, I meant to say, to guide the way that we live today. Would your spirit remind us, continually push us. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Oh, and I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I Father, it's who 
Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of
Well, Father, we thank you so much for this time, Lord, that we've been able to worship you. And we just want to say thank you for all the things that you do for us. Because great are you, Lord. And we're going to go into our time of communion and we just remember just the blood that you spilled out as you made a sacrifice, a living sacrifice for us. And your body that was broken on the cross and the beating that you endured so that we could have an eternal home with you. And Lord, we just want to say thank you because you alone are great. Great and mighty and worthy only to be praised above all men and all things. Great are you, Lord. Lord, we just want to give our lives back to you as a living sacrifice to say, Lord, thank you for the life that you have redeemed, that you saw us even in our worst conditions, even in our blemishes, and even in our greatest moments, you still saw value in us, that you were willing to die on a cross for us, to give us a way to salvation, a way to have eternal home with you. And so, Lord, we just want to say thank you that you have that kind of love, that deep, passionate love for us as your kids that you adopted when we were far off. Father, thank you for that. And so, Father, we just want to say thank you for all the things that you are doing in our church, that we are going to be a light into this community, that we are going to shout and sing praises for you because you are the name above all names, the only one that we could ever find salvation in. So, Father, again, as we take this time of communion, we just turn our hearts to you because it is you, Lord, that we worship. It is you that we praise. And we just say thank you for the, the journey, the suffering, the discomfort, and just the inconvenience of this time. And we look forward that we will gather together as a church in local congregations again. But even as we are separated, Lord, may our hearts be hungry to spend time in fellowship for one another to share in life together. Lord, we thank you. We love you. Grateful for this time together. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hey, Thrive Church. I'm going to be leading us in communion again this week. So if you haven't already gotten some juice and some bread or some crackers or something to do communion, feel free to hit pause on this video right now and run and get them and then unpause it when you get back. Uh, Steve just finished talking about how tomorrow's hope guides today's actions. I really wanted to zero in on that by looking a little bit more at verse 17. Uh, Steve went through it. I'm gonna, I really like the way the message version puts it. It says, you call out to God for help and he helps. He's a good father that way. But don't forget, he's also a responsible father and won't let you get by with sloppy living. Just like any good dad, he's going to give you some grace, but he's going to call you back to making sure you do the right thing. I just wanted you guys to zero in on that a little bit as you do communion, to spend some time thinking through what it means that God gives us grace. But he also expects us to live a certain way and why he would do that. But also as we talk through what it looks like to have this kind of spiritual stubbornness where we do the right thing, even when it's not easy, we can look at Jesus and how he did that when he went to the cross. He had this stubbornness that would have been easy for him to veer off track and go and do something else. But because he cared about us, because he cared about God's glory, he followed through and sacrificed, especially when it wasn't easy. And you and I both know that's um, a mark of a strong man, especially a strong man of God. So think through that. Think through how you can be a person who lives with spiritual stubbornness, the right kind of stubbornness as you take communion today. And think through how Jesus was that kind of guy. Thanks, Thrive Church. Have a great week.